Hello everyone, this is Ross at Teacher Talk at the most influential blog on education in the UK. Today I am honoured to be joined by E.D. Hirsch, Don Hirsch, an Amer American educator and academic literary critic, um, particularly famous probably here for teachers here in the UK who are familiar with the terms cultural literacy. And I know a couple of the books that I've read from Don include the schools we need and why we don't have them. And one of my uh, most uh, recent favourites, Why Knowledge Matters. And Don's got a new book out, um, which we're going to talk about, called How to Educate a Citizen. Um, Don, I, I, I know you're a very wise and experienced um, man. Could you introduce yourself to our listeners and uh, give us a brief synopsis of your new piece of work? Well, <laughs> my life is so long and ancient now that I, I won't go through yeah. <laughs> all, the, uh, all the stages, but uh, uh, I was in English literature, I was an English prof professor of English literature, um, uh, but, and I got interested in language and the technical side of language, and I, there was, uh, just about the time I was doing this, I found out from uh, psychological research that it turns out that the unsaid is very important to understanding what is written down or what is uh, said openly. And, and this whole range of background knowledge is needed to understand what people are saying. Well, fast forward to the classroom. Mm -hmm. And uh, so those kids in the classroom, some of them are understanding what you, the teacher, are saying. And some of them are not understanding it. And the distinction between those two is whether they have the relevant background knowledge to understand the language. Uh, Polly put the kettle on, we'll all have tea. Put the kettle on what? Hmm? Yeah. And uh, what's in the kettle? And that, it, it, some kids know, some kids don't. So the kids that don't are mystified and they're left behind. So it's about making that implicit more explicit and uh, give it a level in the playing field, I guess is the way you're termed. That's right. That, that was the real motivation of all my work in, uh, uh, in pedagogy and in uh, education, early education. My focus on early education because yeah. uh, the focus is on equity. Mm -hmm. Well, excellence as well as equity, both are, are uh, actually go together because everybody in the class needs to be brought along so they understand the language of the classroom. I think everybody can understand that and even at the college level you find these distinctions between people who understand what's going on, people who don't. But the trick for, for making the classroom into what the technical people call a speech community is that the classroom uh, the kids in the classroom, the children, need uh, to have the relevant background knowledge for the language of the classroom itself, mm -hmm. so they understand the next step in learning. And that seems to me so fundamental now, I mean, uh, that everybody should understand the language of the classroom is a pretty simple idea. Yeah. And, <laughs> and of course, a lot of people throw up their hands and say, well, some kids have uh, very favorable backgrounds and some kids have very mm -hmm. unfavorable backgrounds. But uh, everybody, if, it, it, how do you, uh, especially for kids with, uh, with disadvantaged backgrounds, how do, how, does, how do you get them to understand what's going on? And I think the, the answer is not very complicated. If you base what you're saying on uh, on what you have already dealt with in the class, if you're gradually building up the classroom into a speech community so that one topic builds on the prior topic and so on, then everybody's on an even playing field. And sure. actually, the work that we've done in the United States uh, indicates yes that is true uh -huh. and in fact if you combine uh, language instruction with uh, knowledge instruction so to speak yeah 
then kids catch up. And, um, and Don, I'm, I'm keen to ask um, the psychological aspects. Can I just unpick your own personal motivations for your for your work? You know, you're born in Memphis, which I have been to, by the way. Uh, in I wasn't there in 1928, like your good self. But um, <laughs> can I just learn what you what motivated you? Was it your own childhood, your own education itself? Well, uh, I my parents uh, happened to be a little bit independent of the uh, culture of the South and the intense racism of the South. And mind you, being born in 1928 in Memphis, Tennessee, racism was totally endemic. I mean, it was mm -hmm. part of the Southern culture. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, uh, my parents were a bit of an exception to that, and I think that's what started me off on my, uh, as it were, egalitarian motivations mm -hmm. and uh, anti-racism. And uh, when I was doing the uh, fast forward a, couple, a few decades, and when I was doing uh, the research on uh, language, I wrote a book called Theory of Interpretation. And um, that got me into, uh, deeply into uh, linguistic science. And so being motivated by this kind of uh, social egalitarian uh, idea, I, uh, I, uh, <laughs> I was chairman of the English department at, at UVA, at the University of Virginia, and I, uh, when I stepped down, I decided to become uh, head of the uh, writing program, the uh, creative, uh, teaching kids how to write. And, and there, uh, what I discovered, you have the same problem in, in writing as you do in reading and comprehending speech. You have to know the background knowledge of your audience. You have to know the language itself. And, and so I was doing some actual experimentation, and that took me into some uh, black colleges in, uh, in, in the state of Virginia. And there I found out I couldn't even conduct my research because the students in that class did not understand sure. the question. As it were. Well, this emerged into your cultural literacy type. Uh, that's, that's right. Yeah, that's right. So. Uh, it, well, yes, it, it evolved into a book that, to, to everyone's surprise, became a bestseller. And uh, it was called Cultural Literacy. Yeah. And, and I, I just sort of made a compendium. I, I did some research with teachers all, all over the country and so And into, well, what is it that the uh, literate people know that the not, not very literate people don't know? And uh, that uh, produced a, a list. And of course, it was the list that uh, made that, that mm -hmm. book famous. Nobody paid any attention to the cognitive <laughs> psychology. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, okay. so that's, that's the long and short Right, story. okay. So um, cognitive psychology, um, you'll be pleased to hear that are many teachers uh, across British schools internationally, not just schools here in the UK, are starting to become very interested in the cognitive science of the classroom, which is great news. Um, I'm going to just pass two terms by you um, that I know you've mentioned in your new book, which we'll come to shortly, which here in the UK cause quite a bit of a fuss in terms of probably political division. Those two words, one is knowledge rich, and the other term is child-centered, a child-centered classroom. Can I, can I start off with the term knowledge rich first, Don? Well, knowledge rich is, it, it, it is central to what I'm advocating. And it's not just knowledge rich, but coherent uh, progressive of knowledge for the reason I stated at the beginning, so that the classroom becomes a speech community. And, uh, but in addition, uh, it's not just to make the classroom a speech community, it's to develop the knowledge in the student uh, that will enable him to communicate with other people in the society uh, effectively, both, and also to understand what is written down. 
mm -hmm. uh, to understand that inside of it. You have to have that uh, knowledge base in order to have the language base. And everybody admits you need the language base. What hasn't been understood is you can't have one without the other. Sure. You need, you need the shared knowledge within the nation in order to have shared communication. And that uh, insight uh, needs to be exploited, dealt with. Nobody in, sci in cognitive science disagrees with that. Basic so can, can, I, can I steer this towards the kind of knowledge versus skills debate? Um, for me, the skills underpin all the knowledge. You know, you can't have those skills without that fundamental knowledge. Um, how, how, how do you see this kind of progressive traditional debate that might have evolved as, you know, that's been redefined as knowledge versus skills? Or, or are they the same thing? Um, uh, well, that's, the, uh, that's a fascinating subject. I'm glad you brought it up because another thing uh, that was discovered in cognitive psychology in recent years, besides the knowledge base of language, is the knowledge base of skills. Uh, there is no such thing as a general skill. Uh, there was a, a chap who's just died now, a distinguished psychologist named uh, Anders Ericsson, yes. who uh, um, uh, I'm sorry, I just <laughs> uh, there was a uh, a distinguished guy, a psychologist, Anders Ericsson, who simply said bluntly, "There is no such thing as a general skill." Yeah, and and uh, the the term of art used in psychology is skills are domain specific. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, it means that the old uh, the progressive statement of facts are unimportant, general skills, uh, critical thinking, and so on are what's important. It turns out that that's a false debate, uh, or it's a falsely stated debate that that there's no such thing as a general skill. There's no such thing as general critical thinking skill. You have to know what you're talking about mm -hmm. or, or reading about. And that is almost as fundamental as the first point that uh, I made, the discovery of the knowledge basis of language, the knowledge basis of skills. So you better have a knowledge-rich schooling because since there is no such thing as critical thinking skill in the abstract, and <laughs> anybody who throws that term around should be challenged yeah. because they don't, know what, they don't know what they're talking about. Sure. And, and I, but, I, I, but mind you, mind you, it's, a, it's really interesting because uh, one of the progenitors of this kind of education is probably so-called child-centered education. Uh, was uh, the American philosopher John Dewey. At least he was very influential in, in the United States. And Dewey admitted that uh, if you didn't have uh, the goal of a general critical thinking skill, that uh, progressive education was, would be a bust because it was too scattered, too diverse people, uh, students studying and learning different things. And if Dewey were alive now, he would have said, well, that theory was wrong mm -hmm. because science has shown there's no such thing as a general skill. That's terribly important in, in discussing this knowledge. Yeah, which, I mean, if I think of my own, um, my own cultural literature for pedagogical content knowledge specifically is my own understanding of how critical skills align with the knowledge debate and how the, they underpin pretty mm -hmm. much anything else that you can do. And, I, and now looking at teachers across the UK system who are engaged with research and theory and cognitive science, you can see how this is starting to evolve teacher pedagogy here in the UK. I want to come to now the child-centered uh, topic. Again, it gets a bit of a mixed reputation over here. And I, I think I understand your contentions with it, but just can I just hear for podcast listeners' benefit, your views on the child-centered approach? Well, first of all, I think uh, education should be child-centered. And uh, the term I like to use, in the States, it's called personalization or differentiation. Those yes. are the technical terms that, that teachers are offered, uh, uh, and maybe in the UK as well. Yeah. Uh, for what child what what child centered education is, uh, I like to use the term accommodation 
which is taken from biblical studies, actually, uh, okay. because that's indicating that, yes, you pay attention to the individual child in order to teach the same content to everybody. You do need to accommodate. Accommodation is critical. Uh, uh, that's a term that's taken from hermeneutics, which is uh, that's great biblical study. You know, the, the, the good Lord accommodated his language to the understanding of the, the people. And that's why you have certain discrepancies in scripture. And so, but, uh, and I like that term accommodation. The child-centered education is essentially um, went to content, uh, it, at least in the United States it did so that you have diverse content in, in, in lit and in language study. And that was a step too far, it was a mistake. Uh, because for reasons that we talked about at the beginning of this, mm -hmm. namely that you have to bring all kids along so they understand the language of the classroom. Sure. Uh, that, that suggests, by the way, uh, the big difference, I suppose, technically between uh, knowledge base and child-centered is whether you have whole class instruction or not. Uh, in, in the States, you have a lot of kids uh, in the early grades sitting around a table doing projects and doing what they call centers, uh, centers, in the, in, instead of having uh, the whole class. And teachers are told in the United States, don't, uh, don't be a sage on the stage, be a guide on the side and mm -hmm. let everybody do his own, own thing and discuss it. That hasn't worked very well. The United States has sunk way down in its uh, rankings in the international comparisons. And uh, we in the States, I'm saying, need to get hold of ourselves and, and change what we're doing. <laughs> Sure. So um, given, you know, I know you take influence from Gramsci uh, and uh, you, you talked talk about John Dewey as well. Are, are there any things that you still, um, you know, from Gramsci in particular that still influence your thinking today that you just want to highlight for listeners? Well, I actually, I would put it this way. I, I have decided to stay away from gurus and turn to scientists. Right. Uh, <laughs> the, the thing about gurus is that... Uh, they don't necessarily keep up with what we're finding out. Now, just to give you one significant example, uh, because there's a lot of debate nowadays about culture and whose culture and, yes. and so on. What's terribly important to understand is that national cultures are artificial affairs that are created by schools. I mean, schools are the, are the culture creators themselves. And, uh, and people can have more than one culture, and it's incumbent on the schools of a nation to, to implicate a common culture for the country. And what's that made of? I mean, what the constituents are is open for a democratic uh, Absolutely, yeah. debate. But it's the duty of the school leaders to reach a decision about it so that yes. everybody, has, everybody has a shared culture. And, and that basic principle, it's very important to, to see another bit of science, it seems to me, which is the brain studies that have been going on, mm -hmm. which say children are born with a blank slate. They're not, there's no such thing inherently as black culture, brown culture, yellow culture. Those, there are no ethnicities that a child is born with. Ethnicities are made. They're not yeah, born. Human constructs, you'd say. Yeah, they're uh, what? I, I mentioned the word, they're, they're human constructs, so to speak. The way we, we uh, well, yes. bias. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, I talked about Gramsci influence in yourself. Uh, and the, I know you've uh, worked with, uh, in some uh, shape or form with uh, Michael Gove and Nick Gibb. Could you just, for listeners, uh, you know, here in the UK, uh, how you have, have influenced their thinking that's then influenced education here in England? I, that, I, I, I'm afraid that's a subject I don't know anything about. Uh, <laughs> I'm, deli I'm delighted to hear that. Uh, well, you're inspiring our politicians, which is inspiring our education system. Um, before before <laughs> yeah, I come to I your mean, book, 
Well, well, all I can say is, isn't it too bad that the that the Brits were smarter than the Americans and got influenced by it? Yeah, well, I wouldn't that's... say I, I wouldn't say it was my ideas. <laughs> I put together things things that I was discovering from cognitive science. Yeah, and uh, Don, Don, you know, I happen to read uh, cognitive science. Yeah, well, uh, it's great. You'll be pleased to know that a lot of teachers here in the UK are getting really immersed with cognitive science and actually starting to write about it as well as influence their own research in their classroom. Good. I'm going Good. to put you in a corner. Could you give me some tips that you would recommend that teachers do in their classrooms that are one, one theoretical, but two, maybe a practical technique? Well, as, as I was indicating, that change from uh, so-called personalization or uh, uh, differentiation where uh, kids are uh, grouped off by themselves. I don't know how much of that kind of pedagogy goes on in Britain as compared to USA. USA is completely kids uh, in, in the early grades, which is what I'm concerned with. Mm -hmm. the, the children are all uh, placed around big tables, a, a group of five or four, five or six kids around a, a, a big table and they're all taught facing each other. And I think there's a, there's a lot to be said for the teacher being a sage on the stage mm -hmm. instead of a guide on the side, because the guide on the side is leaving some kids out. It has yeah. been, and that's what, uh, that's what the data say. So you'd be familiar with uh, the term discovery learning or that child-centered approach. Where... Well, that's the, now let's talk about the science in relation to discovery learning. Uh, I, I wish that uh, a big article by three distinguished cognitive scientists uh, were more widely known in the education community, but essentially, oh, well, they've written a series of articles. And it is bunk discovery learning or so-called constructivism. That's the bit noir of, uh, of American early education mm -hmm. because the claim is that if the learner actually goes through the labor and of discovering something for themselves, a constructs knowledge from herself, that that knowledge will be more firmly implanted and they'll have general skills and so on. Both of those assertions are incorrect. Mm -hmm. They're not consistent with, with experimentation. They're not consistent with uh, cognitive, cognitive theory that we now have. In other words, discovery learning is uh, totally incompatible with novice learners. And that's what we have in elementary mm -hmm. school, after all, novice learners. They need to be guided. So I'm, get, I'm guessing, I'm, I'm trying to interpret the theory that you've got that um, uh, learning shouldn't be left to chance. And if we want to kind of have a more equitable society, um, where I guess in the UK, just like you, uh, the, sorry, in the US, here we have in the UK, you have very extreme wealth and very extreme levels of poverty. And we're trying to, I guess, give kids a, per, a fairer chance by that cultural literacy. If, I, if, if I'm close enough to, uh, your work, Don. Um, I want to just talk about your book, um, How to Educate to Citizen. Could I ask you to give us a 20, 30 second overview for listeners who are uh, be curious to purchase and, and read through your work? Well, in, in, to, in a lot of ways, we've just uh, covered what's in the book because uh, after all, the bottom line is what do you do in the classroom? And that's what we've been talking about. Yes. In addition, in addition, though, I, uh, I have a plug at the end. Well, I think this, uh, we haven't discussed fully that question of ethnicity and the, the constructed character of ethnicity and the fact that it's the duty of a nation's schools to give everybody, as one of their multiple ethnicities, a common ethnicity. Uh -huh. that, that, that's a kind of duty that's horrifying uh, to uh, what I would call the romantic multiculturalists who say, oh, let a thousand flowers bloom. No, not in the area of language and communication. You can't do that. And, uh, and so there needs to be a commonality. There needs to be a, uh, a, a, a national ethnicity. And uh, that's certainly the case in the, in the U.S. and also in Britain. And uh, uh, that's 
uh, one issue. What was the other question you asked about? I, I was asking, you know, more about, you know, the synopsis of your book and, you know... Oh, well, I, I, as I said, there's a bit at the end about patriotism. And yeah. uh, what patriotism really uh, amounts to, in, in my way of thinking, is uh, altruism. Uh, uh, the, I, I like that uh, motto of the French Revolution, liberty, equality, fraternity. And I was stressing, well, trying to get a non-gendered version of fraternity. And, and uh, the non-gendered version that I came up with was kindness, because it turns out that that word kind, in the sense that we mean it could be kind to other people, that that altruistic uh, interpretation uh, is uh, linguistically the basis of the word. Kind is who your siblings are. It's your kind, as it were, in, in biology. Mm -hmm. and, and so kindness comes from kin and that kind of uh, idea that everybody's related. And, and that kind of patriotism uh, needs to be inculcated. And uh, just as a, as a general point, I took a, um, a clue from the so sociobiology and uh, E.O. Wilson. I don't know if you know that, that work, but in any case, uh, and evolutionary psychology too, and that is that selfishness may get you ahead within a group. And this is across the biological spectrum of, of mm -hmm. species. Um, selfishness can get you ahead within the group, but altruistic groups always defeat selfish groups. Okay. And uh, and uh, I think that's a, that's a. And you mentioned that uh, nationalism and patriotism aren't dirty words. Could you? I know there's a whole chapter dedicated to this, but um, you know, we look at the you know the Donald Trump era. Uh, you, you, we, we've all uh, having to deal with ethnicity, racism, migrants, all those types of things that are going to make um, improve life chances for some people from difficult backgrounds um, to try and uh, reduce this polarization that we see uh, through social yeah. media and in pockets of our society. Um, what are your hopes for at least um, America <laughs> in, in the future? Well, uh, all I can say is Biden is ahead now. And, uh, so. <laughs> he, he certainly is. Um, <laughs> now, um, Don, I always ask my um, podcast interviewers uh, what they hope to be their legacy. And I'm, I suspect this book is yours. But could I just uh, put you on the spot? And from your entire life in education, uh, what, what do you hope to impart to the human race? Well, it, yes, I mean, uh, all one has left are, are those books and articles and things, and uh, that's left over. And I have great hopes that uh, this particular uh, line of thinking, to the extent that at least in America, we can think about long range, anything long range at all, mm -hmm. uh, that, that this book will will have a bit of life to it and that the elementary schools will get to be more coherent and, and will start creating speech communities in the classroom. That, that's a tremendous legacy if, if it happens to work. That yeah. life, is, life is tragic, one does not, you can't no. expect. No, um, okay. what I like that you've written in the, the kind of uh, kind of afterword in your book is that our, your, our schools can improve overnight. And our, from our conversation, I really like that the classroom uh, can become a speech community. Uh, that really resonates with me, you know, my own love for culture and literacy. Um, so can I uh, just pull out one, one more thing that you believe that schools can do overnight to kind of um, achieve this core knowledge? Well, uh, think of the confidence that b gets instilled in kids who've grown up in uh, uh, less favorable uh, backgrounds. Think of how they flower. I mean, I've seen it, and, and the, I've described in the book some schools in the South Bronx, which yes. is the most deprived area of New York. 
what has happened to those kids. They win debate contests, citywide debate contests. That's, that's, that's thrilling to see these kids coming from nowhere because their schooling happened to follow these uh, core knowledge ideas. And, and their schooling has been superior to the kids in Westchester, the richest county yeah. in New York. And they they defeat those kids in debate. It's fa it, it's it's. Really I, I, I guess the premise is that this knowledge coherent curriculum that's sequenced with you know well thought through kind of schema, uh, the interleaving practice that's emerging through cognitive science. I guess um, that's something that we should all be considering quite seriously in our curriculum choices. Yes. Fantastic. That's a good summary. That's a good summary. Well, well, that's a good. I think that's a good point to end because my dog here at the background is is, is asking to go for a little dog walk. So, um, uh, Don, it's been a real honour. Uh, I have to say, it's one of my own educational highlights to have a, a bit of time with you. I've got a copy of your book digitally, but I'm definitely going to get a physical copy. Um, thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you for your influence on. Uh, uh, personally, I think worldwide education. Never mind just here uh, over in the UK. Uh, and all the best with your uh, next. Uh, I, I'm confident our best-selling book yet again. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you, Don. All the best. Right. right. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>